They have produced age-appropriate um, information booklets for children which talk through um, the various uh, stages, I suppose, of the criminal justice process and explain the information that children need to have about visiting prisons and so on. Um, I wonder if it would be possible to, to, to gather together information like that that the different countries produce, because I know other countries produce that type of information as well, and try to clarify what information universally children need to know, what would, what would be a benefit so that some countries that perhaps don't have that type of guidance can um, develop their own um, based on, on shared, shared good practice. That is very <laughs> creative. <laughs> okay. Inakshi Ganguly and uh, Hak Center for Child Rights India. Uh, I wanted to share with you the initiative of the open prisons in India as an alternative way in which parents and children can continue to be together and in fact the families can continue to be together even while the prison sentence is on and that is a way of ensuring that families don't break up and children's have, children have a degree of normalcy in their lives. Thank you. Hi, I'm Wasim Hussain. Uh, I'm part of the coping project. I'm, uh, I'm also the guardian of Raheel Hussain, who actually did the presentation today. I'm quite surprised that not much has been mentioned about technology and how technology could actually help in improving the communication between child, children, and the parents, especially when they're out and about. For instance, now, Raheel has been constantly on his Facebook, so social media is very open to children, and they use it quite often, even through their mobile phone as a technology, but it's, it hasn't been addressed in any way. I know there is some work that has been done, uh, and is going ahead in Jamaica. Uh, I can't remember your name, but Jason, uh, uh, which is covering that aspect. But it is a very big, uh, you know, is an area that should be looked at uh, and should be embraced and not be... Uh, hidden away and put, put to one side because, for instance, if a child's birthday is coming up, they can take some photos, put them online, and obviously in a controlled environment. And when they go and meet their, ch their parents, they can have this discussion and there's some conversation that, to t that can take place. Uh, technology should be embraced and it shouldn't be hidden away. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Stuart, Stuart uh, Hart. Uh, no. Who's who's he, 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 he will Here? he will talk to us and do yeah, that's great. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jason Day, Youth Greece, Sweden. Um, I just wanted to add to what my friend um, spoke about technology, and uh, just to throw this question out to to everyone here is. How can we use technology to improve and sustain the relationship between children and their parents in prison? In particular, um, adolescents who understand and um, are asked you know, the, the, the wise question, you know, how, why can't I know more about the justice system? Why can't my parent um, be a part of my life and stuff like that? I would also um, like to know that this is a new era and most people are afraid to speak about technology because of security reasons and, and lack of, of knowledge and understanding of how it works. Um, Youth Crease has a pilot project and we're in the beginning stages of having, um, this project is called Crease Book. It, it's a social um, site only for children with parents in prison. Um, the, the child will be able to upload videos, pictures, songs, poems, and even stories, so that the parents in prison will be able to, to see what is happening with their child, and that also enhances the visits. Whenever a child visits the prison now, there's not much to talk about. It's difficult to, to, to pick a topic. And um, so with Chris's book, the, the parent will be able to see what their child is doing, they were able to, to strike a conversation. Say for instance, um, the child uploaded a video of say a football game. The dad or the mom in prison at the visit 
could say, okay, I like how you play and you could do this better, or, you know, stuff like that. So there could be this ongoing relationship. And also, <coughs> when using technology, we have this program where the parent will learn to read. Because in Jamaica, there are a lot of persons in prison, they are not able to read or read well. So they will be able to increase their reading by going to classes so that they can make the read-along books that we will make, um, we'll have the system provided where they can read a storybook that their child is currently using in school and when their child is reading that book they could listen to their parent reading the same words. Thank you. Uh, I imagine many people are energized by what we've just heard from our last two speakers. Uh, in association with that and the great expectations for technology or, and for the transformations we're talking about, there is a structural wall in many parts of the world that we're going to have to learn to deal with uh, out from outside the uh, correctional system and from within those. In many places, some would say most places, prisons and the correctional systems understand themselves to be in place to apply punishment, uh, to keep people out of society for periods of time, uh, rather than to have uh, the advancement of the human condition as a, as a goal. This, in fact, in some places, also serves the interest of those who run correctional systems and prisons. As some have called them the prison industries. If people are rehabilitated, you don't have so much work to do. So in one way or another, we're going to need to work to see that prisons, in fact, are committed to rehabilitation, restoration, helping people to become socially responsible citizens, uh, to have the integrity that will serve them and their families and the, uh, the societies. This would be the human rights approach, and this must be given priority. Uh, do and do, at, uh, before you speak, please give Tell your name. Yeah, thank you. Elsa Knutson, London School of Economics. Um, speaking about Canada, um, I wanted to bring up, a, um, I guess, a rights-based concern. Um, we've been speaking about the rights of children to have visits with their parents, to, to have uh, contact with their parents, but there's a, a lot of ways, um, at, at least that I know of in my country, um, where that right is not meaningful because um, uh, barriers exist um, to its kind of fruition. Um, in a big country like Canada, uh, where uh, we have vast distances and uh, some people, partic uh, particularly Aboriginal people living in remote communities, um, people can be incarcerated far, far from home, particularly if they're in the federal system, um, rendering family visits um, almost impossible. In some countries, such as the UK, there is uh, financial support available to some, at least, um, families who wish to visit a, uh, a prisoner far away, um, and, and that would be a recommendation I would I would strongly support. Um, and also picking up on the last points, using technology to foster contact where distance or best interests of the child or safety um, don't make direct visits possible. So for example, video conferencing, video visits, which are used in some countries, um, the storybook dads programs that are used in many countries um, to kind of facilitate um, uh, meaningful visits. Um, uh, um, yeah, so uh, support for, for both uh, creative uh, creative methods of fostering contact and also financial support for making the right to contact meaningful. Good morning, Apolline Bergier, speaking on behalf of Point Coeur. Our association sends volunteers to live among in uh, economically uh, unfavorable uh, areas where in Honduras, for example, we have links, friendship with children, adolescents whose parents are incarcerated. One important issue, mainly in the developing countries, and it's something that was raised by our volunteers about these children, is specifically 
the problem of the cost to reach the detention center where their parents are uh, detained. They often don't have the means to do this. They're not a company. They cannot get there. Uh, financially impossible as well. So in the form of a recommendation, it would be to provide uh, financial and social means to make it possible for these children to visit their parents in prisons regularly. Uh, to maintain, and this is in order to maintain uh, links with their and uh, contact with their parents. Please, yes. Hello, Laura Bevan from Penal Reform International. Um, my first point just follows on from points made by LSE and children and families across borders. Um, it's to support absolutely funding for children to be able to visit their parent in prison, but with special consideration to be given to foreign national prisoners who if their family do not live in the same country as them, for example in the UK system, they're not allowed funding to, to visit their family. Um, so it's, I suppose, to, to urge governments to think about ways to enable children to visit their parents if they're overseas. And my second point is um, on the subject of alternatives to imprisonment, um, thinking about ways for caregivers to avoid a prison sentence, for example, in the country of Georgia, you can suspend uh, the mother's sentence for a year um, if they have a, a young child. Um, and in some countries in Central Asia, you can suspend it for much longer, for example, until the child is, I believe, 14 or older. Um, so that's a way of avoiding the negative impact on the child, at least temporarily. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we yes, thank you, Oliver Robertson. Um, the way the two working groups were divided is that the substantive discussion around visiting um, it gets covered by working group one um, in particular the periods when the children are in the prison visiting is covered by working group one who are dealing with the issues within the prison um, i think that some of the discuss some of the converse some of the things we've had of on the right side of this divide but we need to make sure that with contact we don't steer too far into the visits issue. Um, they will be covered within the day of general discussion um, and so our job is also to make sure the other issues are covered as well. Thank you. Okay, next speaker please. Please. You. Okay. Well, uh, I'm talking in behalf of the Ombudsman for Children in Croatia and as a member of Eurochips. Uh, well, we are dealing with the uh, most aspects uh, what we are heard uh, today about. Uh, but uh, now I want uh, to tell that uh, we as an independent parliamentary body try to, what somebody today uh, mentioned, try to uh, set the common minimum standards uh, according to the each relevant aspects. Our experience, generally speaking, is that is very useful, mostly useful, uh, when we gathered the uh, rem uh, representatives of uh, relevant um, subjects uh, including state agencies, NGOs, uh, parliamentary bodies, and especially experts from every professional area. And when they are talking in public, in front of the media, of course, avoiding sensationalism and uh, pro trying to protect uh, children's privacy, then um, something changed in every area. Uh, this is our experience, especially trying to uh, be a partner with media, but, uh, every, uh, uh, but trying to uh, avoid, as I said, sensationalism, uh, keep privacy of children, uh, and uh, try to uh, incorporate uh, scientific uh, knowledge and 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 uh, and and uh, the examples of good practice. Thank you. Thank you. Who will be the next speaker? Please. 
Thank you. Uh, Jan Wetzel, Amnesty International again. I'm, I'm mindful that visits was just include <laughs> uh, excluded from the discussion here, but let me just, please allow me to just make one very, very short point uh, uh, in addition to what I said earlier on with regard to death row, um, because I think it is a general point also for, for other forms of uh, incarcerated persons. In lots of situations, especially in death row, contact visits are prohibited. And I think um, one recommendation the committee may want to think about is that contact visits, meaning f visits enabling physical contact, especially for smaller children, should be enabled whenever possible, and in, in our opinion, especially when it comes to uh, last visits uh, to persons um, uh, to be executed soon. Thank you. Thank you, and I accept this recommendation at least. Okay. Uh, what about the other speaker? Uh, you first, then. Um, I thought I would uh, pick up on a couple of the specific questions that Oliver posed. Uh, the one about how can parents uphold their parental responsibilities. I think one of the problems of uh, prison, uh, in fact any institution, is it strips people of their responsibilities. Um, and there are a number of ways in which this, this could be addressed and indeed are being addressed in different countries. One way... Uh, I think a lot of people, parents who are in prison actually have perhaps, uh, this may be a bit controversial, but perhaps don't understand or have never actually put into practice their parental responsibilities. Uh, a lot of them have a very poor, uh, they have no positive role model themselves of having been positively parented. Um, and there's some very good education programs that, that are run by NGOs inside prison, parenting programs where prisoners are actually working on how to be become a better parent or a good parent and understand what it is to play with your child, what it is to engage with your child, and then that feeds through into better contact with their child when they're on the telephone, when they're um, uh, meeting them through visits. So I think it can be done in that way. I think something else that we haven't talked about is uh, the opportunities. Uh, the lady from India mentioned open prisons. Before prisoners, uh, we also have open prisons, and one of the, the opportunities within an open prison is for prisoners to start to go out on temporary release and that can be tied into parental responsibilities for example enabling parents to attend um, parent meetings in their children's school or attending key events for their children outside of the prison but that needs to be um, reinforced in that or in sort of framework agreements that, that this is something that is an acceptable um, an acceptable reason to be given a temporary release from prison but it's one way in which that that can be done I'd also just very very briefly like to mention telephone contact we've talked about the use of the internet and we've talked about uh, face-to-face -face visits. Telephone is also a vital part of contact and I think much more needs to be done partly to uh, make sure that the cost of telephone calls. Many, many countries charge prisoners exorbitant rates to call their families, which means that they can't actually afford to do so, and also to explore the opportunities, particularly for children, to be able to phone in to their parents in prison. There are one or two pilots, but more could be done along those fronts. Thank you. Gracias, Pilar Norris. Thank you, Pilar Norris from the Human Rights Committee. Referring to the communication media, uh, the latest kidnappings in Peru took place from within the uh, prison managed and organized by cell phones from inmates, and it makes it possible for them to shift the crime to the other side of the border. So we also have to, it's a double-edged sword, in other words, we have to uh, see to what extent we're infringing on one of the main obligations uh, when an individual is isolated. It's very difficult to talk about only the relationship with uh, children using um, modern technology. Thank you. Sabine Skuter from German Red Cross. I have one example in Germany found that is really interesting. Um, they call it housewife sentence. And it is uh, uh, like, uh, uh, it is like that uh, the, the mothers uh, leave uh, their house in the morning 
to, uh, to, to, to do their sentence and they come home in the evening to be mothers again. Just simple. Uh, going from, uh, from morning tears, something about uh, life outside prison and, and stigmas and, and, and those things actually. Um, one of the places where, where the children, of course, meet a lot of problems and where they can feel a lot about the stigma is, is, is the place where they spend uh, eight hours a day at least, and that's at school. Um, of course, it's not easy to change the school, but, but we had uh, we developed lesson packages for, for, for teachers, actually, uh, that makes the whole subject discussable uh, in the school, and actually we had very good results. Uh, to, to, to make actually the burden of, of the children who have a parent in prison living in that school uh, less heavy. So I would say as a recommendation also especially work on all the social environments of, of the kid and, and the school is important in that, make people there aware of what problems these children face. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker. Okay, please. Madam, please. Tian Newell, um, OSI in the U.S. We've done a lot of work uh, within the school systems across the nation uh, on behalf of children of prisoners. And I just wanted to add that um, total immersion and, and sensitization of everyone within the school system is needed in order to do uh, or to mitigate some of the stigma. And uh, as an example, the Chicago School District, which has 45,000 children of prisoners in the one district, um, did engage and we did do training throughout and we are starting to see some very positive outcomes uh, because the training, uh, which has been ongoing, has been so uh, especially helpful. Thank you. Okay, please. Peter Scharf Smith, uh, the Danish Institute for Human Rights. Just one very brief point. I think that. Um, in order to be able to uh, uh, to make these uh, children visible, uh, we need to have statistics. So that's also a, a very good recommendation, I think, to actually count these children and make them uh, uh, visible in terms of having official statistics in every country on approximately how many children of imprisoned parents do we have. We know there are very, very many, but it's quite incredible. It, it would be easy to do just asking parents when they come to prison, for example, um, different ways of doing it, uh, uh, but we need to make uh, uh, the numbers visible. Thank you very much. And I expect to, uh, to know this at the earliest. It means that at the earliest there should be some agency take care of children. Okay. And this, this is very good. Uh, who will be the next speaker? Please. Peter Wedge. I'm from the University of East Anglia in the UK. I'd like to pick up the point about statistics and uh, raising the profile of children with special needs such as those with parents in prison. This is not just an issue for teachers who are involved in teaching or in education settings where there are children who have parents in, in prisons. It's an issue for all teachers. All teachers need to be aware of the concerns that they should have and that their profession should have for all children, including such children as we're concerned about today. And we can extend from teachers to, to the sensitization of other professionals who work in the human resources field. Lawyers, doctors, nurses, and of course social workers. I'd like to think that the Commission will make recommendations about the basic training of professions who work with such people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. You first and you after. Okay, uh, is that on, yeah. uh, Nico Yutin from the Office of Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People. Just uh, picking up on a few things that were said about the lack of data. Uh, 
I think it's a huge issue, and it does. Uh, practitioners certainly tell us that that it uh, the total lack of information about uh, the children of prisoners, how many they are, where they are, who they are, uh, hinders the provision of proper support to them. Uh, in Scotland, we have, for example, in, in education, we've got a very good policy frame, legal framework called the Additional Support for Learning Act, which is all about providing the right support at the right time to children uh, who, for whatever reason, the legislation says, have any, we need a bit of extra help in their education. Uh, people in the education sector tell us that actually these children are invisible. They don't know who the children of prisoners are in their classroom, so that doesn't really work. The government line on children's, uh, children's services and social support for children is that the universal framework uh, will catch the children of prisoners because it's there for all children. But again, if the, the, the justice sector and the social workers and many other people who work with offenders, adult offenders, and those who work with children and families don't speak to each other, then we won't identify those children and won't get the support to them that they need. So my point really is, out of all of this, that the children of prisoners and the situation they find themselves in is really, uh, it, it has to be a cross-sectoral effort. Um, if education and social work get it right, that won't be enough. We also need the justice sector, health sector, and everybody on board. It, it has to be a joint effort. Uh, if not, there's going to be very limited progress. That's really all. Uh, thank you. This lady first and you after. Thank you. Uh, Nazir from Eurochips. Um, just a very brief comment that kind of ties together some of the comments that have just surfaced. Um, in terms of, of schools, just w uh, in terms of the importance of actually raising awareness amongst the teacher training colleges as well to to ensure sustainability of, of the awareness and training and that it enters into the system itself. And in terms of the, Eurochips has been working to establish um, national watchdog organizations, monitoring organizations that would enable well, that it would aspire to gather better statistics on this group of children, but also an important point that has come up today in terms of the need for uh, interagency collaboration amongst the various sectors. So these would be the two um, points of action, if you will, of these monitoring agencies that we would be pressing. Thank you. Deborah Cowley, Action for Prisoners Families. Um, just again following up on the point about identifying um, prisoners children um, uh, we're also very concerned that this is balanced with the children's right to privacy um, it's it's by no means the case that every single uh, child uh, needs an, a specific intervention um, but what we would say is that it's very important that people feel able to call on um, and support and access support when they they do need it so it's a it's a it's a complicated balance in terms of uh, right to support uh, and the right to privacy um, we're constantly pushed I think um, to identify every single uh, prisoner's child uh, as someone um, in in specific need and what prisoners families say to us is that this worries them um, and and they don't want to be stigmatized in this way okay thank you uh, good afternoon diane curry uh, chief executive officer of pops partners of prisoners in the uk um, just to add um, to the gathering of data uh, debate a, a conversation I think it's important that we recognise that if indeed we are to pursue, uh, and rightly so, the gathering of data uh, on the numbers of children who are affected by parental imprisonment, um, then we need to be sure and confident about the explanation we give to families and to parents who are in custody or in the community about why we are doing this and as to what benefits they will receive to indeed disclose uh, the fact that they have children um, and what services they may may be on the receiving end of as a, benefit, as a benefit of this. So it's just for us to be really clear that it's not just about identifying statistics and numbers, but to give people confidence that if they do so, there's something in it for them and, and that things will change for the better if they work with us in disclosure. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oliver. 
Uh, thank you. We're going. We have only a few minutes left um, if we want to discuss everything else on the during imprisonment section. Um, I have. I'd like us to wrap up this section by about a quarter to four, so that when we can discuss the period after imprisonment. Um, until then, any general issues you have around during imprisonment, please te please do say them. Um, I have a few specific questions which would be interesting to hear about. Um, one question relating to contact. We've heard about different forms of contact. Um, in people's experiences, which, which forms of contact seem to have the, most be have the best outcomes for the children and are used most? Um, I think it would be useful to hear more about other aspects of life on the outside um, as and how it is affected by having a parent in prison. So this may include issues such as um, the financial situation of the families and how that can be helped and supported. It might include issues about um, health, about emotions and behavior, or other issues. Um, thoughts and comments and good practice on those issues would be very welcome. Um, if there are specific examples of individuals or groups or services that it is he generally or more often helpful to tell about a child about the parental imprisonment, it would be good to know about that, to get specifics of that. Um, it would also be useful if we hear if there are any more specific issues about particular groups of children, some issues around foreign national prisoners and indigenous uh, children of prisoners have been have been raised. Are there other specific groups as well? Thank you. Now, okay, please. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm Hanne Christofsen from uh, the Organization for Families and Friends of Prisoners Norway. And we are also a member of Euroships. Uh, this is about uh, uh, the situation outside. And it's also a question of uh, letting the children affected tell how it uh, is experienced. and. Uh, Therefore, I would like to take the opportunity to shortly present uh, an example from Norway from the Norwegian Ombudsman for Children, who has established a so-called expert group. And this very example is an expert group made of children with a father in prison. And the objective was to let these children with their special experiences be heard and their views to be deemed significant, significant by the authorities in the field. And our organization cooperated closely with Ombudsman in this expert group process. This work also led to a report recently translated into English. Um, in which the children's experiences and recommendations about what needs to be changed is expressed. The expert group had many opinions, but uh, among them strong opinions on how to make visiting conditions in prisons more child-friendly. Uh, an example where the views were given weight was when Oslo Prison recently rebuilt and improved their visiting facilities and the architects actually implemented the expert group's recommendations into their planning of the new visiting area. And we find this to be a good example of not only letting children be heard, but also giving their views impact. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will... Okay, please. Okay, you first. Um, Inakshi Ganguly, Hug Center for Child Rights. In fact, I was waiting for the opportunity of discussing the children who live in the community because I th that is really the largest chunk of children who are who have 
no voice and they have no, no visibility either because we don't actually know because that's where the numbers come in so how do we know how many children are living outside or in in the communities 